Good morning, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Huddle. I'm your host, Dr. Monica Algando, and we are here for Thursday's Spiritual Matters. Spiritual Matters. And we've been on this, um, I'm going to say series, where we have been talking about sacred gifts. We started with the sacred gift of anger. <laughs> And we moved to the sacred gift of grief. Today, we are talking about the sacred gift of love. And I have a perfect quote for you because, come on, we got we to gotta introduce this right. And it doesn't have the word love in it, but it's all over it. The quote is from Mark Andrew Poe, and he says, Our ability to choose is sacred. It is what makes us human. I love it. I love it. Welcome to the Daily Huddle. All right, we begin today getting ourselves very, very grounded, darling. Um, Rashida, where are you? And what are you thankful for? Great rising, great rising. I am where I supposed to be, right here. And what I'm thankful for, I thankful for love. That's why when anyone is having a discussion with me and they is upset, I say one love, one love. <laughs> that's what I'm grateful for <laughs> I love it <laughs> goodness me. Oh, Michelle how are you and what time is it I am the way I say that I am and I am super sparkly today Yay. I am ready to rock and roll and hear what you have to share with us and the time is now right now it's the only time we have is now amen amen thank you everybody for being here with us on spiritual matters thursdays i wanted to talk about the sacred gift of love because many times when we speak of the dark emotions there's a book called called um facing your dark emotions i believe it's by debbie oh i'm drawing a blank on the author um but when we when we face our dark emotions, part of the reason why we don't face our dark emotions is because they are confrontive and they're sometimes ugly, chaotic, and unpredictable. However, I believe uh, that they are a gateway to greater intimacy, greater connection, and a greater conviction of the heart in terms of what we stand for and what what we allow and disallow, and ultimately lead us to the bottom line, which is what we're talking about today, the sacred gift of love. Ultimately, when we feel anger, it is because our love has in some ways been violated. Ultimately, when we feel grief, it is because our love has been lost in some way. And we only feel grief commensurate to the degree that we have experienced love. You don't grieve things that you don't love. And so today we want to kind of like bring it all together with the sacred gift of love because we tend to romanticize it. We tend to kind of like teenage crush it a little bit. And I think that love is a, is a bit more serious than that. It's a bit more, it's not that um, mercurial, I'm going to say, right? Uh, it's not hormonal. <laughs> So you don't you don't fall in and out of it. It's a decision, which is why I chose that that quote. And and I think that making choices at the bottom of it all, the bottom line of it all, is that um, our ability to choose is sacred. And those of us who empower others or who awaken others to their power of choice are really doing some sacred divine work because that is how we connect to our choice to love. 
So that being said, if love is not a feeling, it's a decision, then what does that look like in your life? Let me give you some language around it so that we can play with it together. Uh, there have been sometimes some of us who have chosen to be parents, for example, and yes, we have a tremendous amount of abnegation towards our offspring, right? Most species that have offspring <laughs> have abnegation and the sense of protection and duty towards um, their offspring. Uh, even mammals, even insects, even, you know, uh, any kind of other, it, it's not just humans. That's not, that's not what makes us human. It's abnegation towards our offspring. Um, however, there are times when our offspring make decisions <laughs> in their own lives that disappoint us, that anger us, that feel like this isn't who I am or who I say that I am or who I raised you to be and da 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 da. Uh, and so that they may engender some feeling of maybe even shame or embarrassment or disappointment, et cetera. And we still continue to love them. So it's not a feeling necessarily. It's not like this gushy, let's hug it out type deal. Uh, sometimes the role of love is to be present when somebody feels or shows up to be the least lovable. That's when love is the most relevant. And uh, so given all that, what does that mean? What, is, what does loving someone mean? Does it mean tolerating poor behavior? Does it mean um, continuing to be present even though they violate your um, standards or boundaries, et cetera, et cetera? And that's not what I'm suggesting at all. You can love somebody from afar and you can love somebody and still transition or break off or graduate the relationship. That's, those are not mutually exclusive. Um, however, there is a sense of believing in the greater aspect of that person or of the circumstance that, that love is committed to. And I think that's the part where love starts to feel quote unquote unconditional. When we can say, I see the worst of you. I recognize the worst of you. I'm going to protect myself from the worst of you. And I still see that you can climb mountains, that you can, you know, um, jump buildings in a single, single bound and all of that other stuff, right? And so, uh, and you can feel that energetically. You can feel that when somebody can uh, hold to a particular standard and still hold you in your power. Have you ever had somebody like that in your life? Maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a spouse, maybe it was your own children. Uh, I tell my, my daughter all the time, uh, that were it not for how high her regard is for me. <laughs> uh, I know she looks up to me. I know that she thinks I'm the bee's knees. And sometimes that is the only thing between me and murder, children. That's the only thing. <laughs> between me and a ratchet moment, you know, that may or may not be captured in social media. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and I laugh, but how powerful is that? That somebody's faith in you could connect you to your potential, to, to connect you to your greater good, that, that connects you to an appeal to, you know, the higher angels, as it were. And so I want to talk with you today about that sacred gift of love and how it has shown up in your life. And I want us to stay away from the gooey stuff. There's plenty of gooey stuff. You can just watch any kind of like, you know, romantic movie, rom-com out there, et cetera, et cetera. I'm talking about like spiritual matters Thursday. That means roll up your sleeves. That means let's look at, you know, what all of these sacred gifts look like in overalls with a hammer in the hand, right? At work is what I mean. <laughs> Not about to commit a murder. Get that out of your mind. That was a joke. So I want to talk with you about this. What does love at work, what does love rolling, rolled up their sleeves and, and, and really um, being in service, what does that look like in your life? How do you express it and how have, has it been expressed to you? Let's talk about it. Yes, yes, Michelle. Um, 
I've got it from both sides with two different children. Mm -hmm. Um, my daughter, Natalie believes in me and I have had to lean into her belief. It was so eye opening. Once we sat down, um, and you know, we met up for a cup of coffee and I don't even remember how we started this conversation, but she told me what she sees. Hmm. And I was like, who is this person you're describing? <laughs> oh my God, I don't recognize me. Mm. And so I really had to listen yeah. and really absorb her belief in me to be that person mm -hmm. because that was in me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I felt mm -hmm. that strengthen me when I felt really weak. Um, and I have to remind myself, to really lean into that when I'm at a low spot. And then on the other side, um, my son Nicholas was an alcoholic and he got into drug addiction and he went to rehab, wash, rinse, repeat. Um, and we finally lost him to alcoholism, but we had to love him at a distance mm -hmm. because we couldn't save him. Right, yeah, yeah. I think it is so important to to note um, the both sides of the spectrum, right? Both sides of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. That when someone and I've I've had that experience as well of being loved at a distance, not because of addiction or anything like that, but because um, sometimes I, when I was younger, especially when I was in college, I was making some financial decisions that were like very irresponsible and very short-sighted um and some friends are like i'm not gonna bail you out i'm not just, I'm just not gonna do it Let's figure it out right and so when i think that's one of the most loving things that we can do to for someone is to leave mm -hmm. them to confront their own power leave them to confront mm -hmm. their own decisions and um mm -hmm. sometimes that can cost them their life um, but my personal belief, I don't know how you believe, uh, what you believe about this, Michelle, but my personal belief is that the soul is eternal. And so to the degree that you don't handle something in this incarnation, there'll be another incarnation for you to continue that work. And, um, and that's okay. Right. And that's okay. Uh, I, I don't purport to know what <laughs> the curriculum is on the divine schedule. I wasn't there for that meeting. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I just did it very well. Thank you for, for uh, your contribution. Rashida, you got something? Thank you so much. Michelle, thank you so much for your transparency. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I am so, so thrilled uh, of this topic. <laughs> love. Love, what love got to do with this? What it <laughs> has to do with this? Trust me. <laughs> yes. And why I say that is because in my kids, um, I have four kids three girls and one boy. Okay. The boy gives me for nine girls, nine girls whole. And we have a chat room where we said good morning to each other, good night and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And one day I, I was reading something, one of my girls um, post and they, and the other, one of the sister answers say, you really want mom to answer you? Mm -hmm. You're going to get yourself in trouble. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, you know what, um, my oldest daughter said, oh, I don't scare mom anyway. She saw to the point that she caught with a sword without having a sword in her hand. <laughs> and, I, and I said, and so I answered back and I said, why? He said, mom, you are so honest and so true that we scare of you. I said, here and the, uh, my youngest daughter say no, it's not scare, it's respect. Why is because in you just give it as it is. Mm -hmm. You don't go around the bush. You and it's my son-in-law. I have three son-in-law. Mm -hmm. The bad, the good, and the ugly. Trust me, <laughs> right. I have the bad, the good, and the ugly. Right. And all three of them <laughs> give me that respect. Marilla, Marilla, what do you think about? It? I said no, 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 no. Don't put me into your mess. Mm -hmm. because I don't want to be the bad man in law because mm -hmm. I'm bad already anyway. So don't give me the title. <laughs> right. But definitely this love topic 
hit home and why is the cousin trust me the love that i have for my kids i started to say do you know what guys i'm going to stop loving you all guys i'm going to start to love me with the same love that i have for you all guys mm. so i start i started to turn the table around and say oh so now they post stuff and i don't answer they say oh mom really started to love ourselves so they post something last week and they say do you know where your mom is because she's off and on an aircraft she was born because she was here she was there and they say and i say to them i told you all guys i'm going to stop loving you all guys and this is the way i show you that i no longer love you all guys i love me myself mm -hmm. and i thank you so much dr ogando for your topic thank you <laughs> I appreciate you. I appreciate your your share. That was a great contribution, and and it also speaks to the ins and outs of understanding one another, right? And and of um being with being with, which is is really what intimacy really is. Being with another human being um sometimes can feel like a rocky boat ride. You know, there's some waves there's some peaks and valleys there are some lows and highs and uh the person going through them sometimes doesn't even control them let alone somebody witnessing it right and so i remember this movie that came out a long time ago with susan sarandon and uh, richard Gere. they played a married couple save the last dance and jennifer lopez played the dance instructor that richard Gere was seeing uh clandestinely <laughs> and susan sarandon's character got a little like why is my husband coming home so late where is he going that he's not at work but he's nowhere to be found and she hired a private investigator to see if her husband was um cheating on her found out that no he's not cheating on you he's just taking dance class and the private investigator is like do you want me to keep going to see if maybe it's something with the teacher or whatever she says no the greatest gift that a human being can give another is to witness their life. And she felt like she witnessed something that she didn't have a right to witness. Um, but now that she knew what it was, you know, she let him have it. And um, we will talk at another time about the shadiness of that decision, okay? Of invading other people's privacy. We're gonna talk about that at some other time. But now I wanna talk about the power of witnessing another. Sometimes we're so used to associating, you tell me what you think about this. In this culture, we are so used to associating fixing a problem with demonstrating love that if you're just witnessing someone and not fixing a problem, it feels unloving. I'm going to introduce or suggest that the opposite is true. That witnessing someone as they are working through their life, standing in their power, discovering their resilience and their ingenuity and their resourcefulness and their patience and their all of that to, for, and, and holding space for that and witnessing that without feeling like I have to fix anything is the loving thing to do. Because if I go in there and fix it for you, the implication or the assumption, right? We were talking about audit auditing your assumptions. The assumption is you don't know how to do your own life. And you need somebody to come in here and clean it up because you're a child. Uh, and that doesn't feel loving to me at all, if that's the assumption, if that's the implication. Um, and so love sometimes feels, um, speaking of feeling, right? That love is not a feeling, but the impact of it, or sometimes the interpretation of it, it sometimes feels like solitude. It sometimes feels like loneliness. It sometimes feels like not having answers. And in that void of not having someone else there or, or having to handle some stuff by yourself, um, sometimes it's like, oh, oh, this is powerful. The, the, the bridge, between two solid places, the, the, you know, when you run, there's like a nanosecond when neither foot is on the ground, when you're literally flying because neither foot is on the ground, right? And it's in that limbo space where you can connect to your own mobility, to your own power, to your speed, to your stamina, to your, all of these things that are available that wouldn't be available um, when one foot is on the ground when you are holding on to someone thing or someone yeah 
And um, let's see, Laura says, I resonate strongly with being a fixer. Michelle says, one of my biggest regrets is rescuing my son when he was younger. Yeah, I think that there's such power in allowing people to figure out what their ingenuity and resourcefulness and power and patience and resilience looks like. And you wouldn't know what resilience looks like unless you had to be resilient about something, unless you had to have ingenuity and resourcefulness about something. Right. And that's part of part of the hard decision around that is knowing when to do it and when not to. Um, because sometimes you feel like, oh, well, if I don't do it and they lose their life, then did I, you know, was I complicit in their destruction? Uh, and then when you do do it and they lose their life anyways, like, did I step in too much? You don't know that. You know, it's that's part of the discernment piece. Laura, you have something? You have your hand up. I had a hard time coming off mute. No worries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle, for your vulnerability. Thank you, Rashida. I say I can resonate strongly with you because I've always been the fixer in my son's life, mm -hmm. fixing some of the projections that I created, mm. trying to control some of what I created is anger. Is, is some of his issues around drinking or around marijuana. And to the point where he, you know, told me the truth about me not being there for him emotionally. He just, just tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. And I kept, kept at him. And until I had to really make a decision, you know what? I'm not going to see you kill yourself. So I, I made some decision that I think helped him to a point, but I still was trying to control his life until he got married and he said to me, get out of my marital, marital affairs. And I got it and I let go and started mm -hmm. to witness him until now he's asking me to be an accountability partner. Mm. on his journey that's what love is for thank you that's beautiful thank you so much laura that was gorgeous i think that um we have to we have to be okay with being the bad guy in somebody's story when they're playing victim and um every time that somebody is in a victim story there has to be a villain there has to be uh this kind of reminds me of the book, The Little Soul and the Sun, you probably have heard me speak about it in previous episodes by Neil Donald Walsh. The premise of that book, The Little Soul and the Sun, Sun Lake, the sun and the sky, is that um, there was this little soul who was in heaven hanging out with all the other perfect little souls. It's a children's book and it's beautifully illustrated. And um, he, the little soul, I'm going to say she, because everybody says he, I'm going to say she, like, damn it. <laughs> um, so the little soul went up to God and she was like, um, I want to learn, I want to go down there and learn forgiveness. And God was like, how? I mean, you're perfect. They're perfect. There's nothing to forgive. There's nothing to be forgiven for. How are you going to do this? And she's like, hmm. I don't know let's see and while she's trying to figure it out there's another soul that comes from the back watching this whole exchange between the little soul and and, and god and she says i'll go down there with you i'll help you learn forgiveness and when i fight you and when i smite you so to give you something to forgive and to be forgiven about don't forget who i am and oh my gosh i'm getting emotional right now just telling the story because what a powerful way to be in relationship with one another. We sometimes think that the people who make our lives the smoothest are the ones that are our advocates. The ones that make our lives the easiest are the ones that are in our corner. But what if the people who fight you and smite you are in on the joke? And at some point before you decided to do this thing called life, 
they decided that they were going to be part of your team as well for the thing that you said you wanted. Not to distract you, not to obstruct you, not to uh, you know sabotage you, but to to contribute to the thing you said you wanted to graduate from in this incarnation. You said you wanted to learn forgiveness. I remember hearing a lecture from the late great Dr. Wayne Dyer, and he said, um, "I know why I chose my mom and dad. I must have decided that I wanted to learn self-reliance in." incarnation such that I would choose a mom who would put a dad in her back would have to put us in foster care and places or whatever where I couldn't rely I had to rely on myself learning something and so on the side like dad was a deadbeat was responsible for couldn't get it et cetera and in the great dangerous. Uh, you said you and a lot of times the soul Okay, I'm trying to play with it. Let me see if this works. We can hear you now. Okay, perfect. What I was saying was that, you know, it looks like on the surface that dad abandoning the family or mom not being able to provide a stable environment was somehow a deficiency. And what it really was at the soul level was you came in here wanting to learn self-reliance. You're going to have to be here with people who leave the door open so that you can meet yourself. That makes sense, right? On the soul level. But try explaining that to a four-year-old who wants mama. Try explaining that to a seven-year-old boy who wants daddy to play ball with him, right? And so sometimes we get caught up in the vicissitudes of the story without understanding the character development or even the plot development at that point. And that was one of the most unforgettable pieces that I had myself in uh, when I, I went to a boarding school called Phillips Academy Andover. And one of the electives, well, they weren't really electives, but one of the electives that you had to take required for graduation, but we're going to call it elective anyway. That's another sermon for another Sunday. Um, was theater. And the theater teacher was an actual paying, active playwright in the Boston theater scene at the time. And he gave us a homework assignment where you had to take one scene of one act of one play and decide why was that line there? Why was that character saying or doing this thing? And if you didn't think that that line moved either the plot or the character development along, then what would you put in its stead? And it looked like a simple assignment on the surface because it's like one scene is like two pages. But in order for you to understand the scene, you had to understand the act. And in order for you to understand the act, you had to understand the play. Because how would you know if this was character development unless you knew where the character was going? How would you know if this was plot development unless you knew how the plot worked out, right? Correct us. Correct us into reading the whole entire thing. <laughs> But the lesson for me was, oh, what if my life is like that? What if my life is a play and the people in it are characters that are either furthering or not furthering my character development alone because I'm the main character in my story, okay? Don't get it twisted. And, or the plot. And so in that case, the villain too has a role. The villain too is a sacred position. And you can't really play tennis unless there's somebody on the other side of the net or volleyball or basketball or football or anything either. The position is part of what makes the game worth playing. So I want to bring you back to the sacred gift of love in that way. Can we see love in opposition? Can we see love in what we think are wounds? or disrespect or violations whether the person meant it or not that's the part that your 
description and narrative of your life isn't up to what somebody else does or says. It's up to what your interpretation and your assumptions and your conclusions are of that. How are you telling the story? Because Dr. Wayne Dyer could have told the story of my dad was a dead meat, no good, blah, blah, blah. But he told the story like he was a sacred in, uh, uh, instrument in my lesson of self-reliance. He had to have done it that way in order for me to get what I needed. So in that way, he, he described his father as a team player. And how gracious, how gracious to be able to see anybody else's shortcomings or anybody else's decisions as part and parcel of your ultimate victory. And that's the sacred gift of love. Yeah. So thank you everybody for being here with us. I appreciate you. Remember, of course, to love generously, to laugh, laugh loud, like tackle even. Give yourself permission to guffaw. Look that up if you don't know that one. Eat more plant-based, stress less, sleep more, move your body. Remember that uh, twerking is a holy exercise of raising your kundalini energy. <laughs> uh, give up your time and energy and attention. And of course, audit your assumptions. Always check yourself before you wreck yourself. We love you. See you next time. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody.